Thoughts that bind us together. This is a staging citizenship lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, at Ostfold University College, which I would like my students to watch by Wednesday, the 2nd of February 2022. Just checking that date there. Um, so we've been talking about performatives kind of at the grammatical level of what we say in individual small situations and of course rituals uh, which in some ways form the kind of practical and institutional context for certain formatives but let's look at the big picture the bigger context um, as teachers we influence the world as we said said when we started the staging citizenship um, module or, or course. Um, we are here to transform the world. We transform the world whether we like it or not. Um, and, um, and the things that we say have an effect on how pupils talk, sometimes for the rest of their lives, um, and the knowledge that, that we teach um, will, will form in many ways the structures for and the, and the habits of how people um, think and talk and therefore um, act. So how do these um, performatives and rituals and thought itself in the world, <laughs> the big picture, how do they all hang together? Um, C.S. Lewis wrote a, a sci-fi novel. C.S. Lewis you may have heard of um, because he wrote the um, Narnia books, uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and so on, that were made into Disney movies. And he also wrote a sci-fi novel that, that is very rarely thought of or mentioned, um, called Out of the Silent Planet in 1938, a long time before the Narnia novels. But like his Narnia novels, um, the planet that he describes in Out of the Silent Planet um, is a place where several rational species um, live side by side, that humans are not the uh, dominant um, species or so dominant that they've wiped out all others. And that, um, whether C.S. Lewis knew that or not, um, um, reflects the um, evolutionary situation um, of our species um, and, and it contributes to the way um, Narnia and Out of the Silent Planet um, have this very different context because we do not have to deal with other species that talk back. Um, Sapiens is alone. Now Harari, who is on your reading list, unlike Out of the Silent Planet, although I do recommend that you read both books, um, asks the question, um, why did sapiens survive whilst the other species, and at one point there were many um, other species um, of, um, of homo, um, why did the others die out and why did sapiens survive? And the whole book, um, Sapiens, is meant to give an answer to that question, to that rather eerie question um, of where did all the others go? Um, so do read, again, the whole book if you've got time um, at one point. Prioritise the reading list, of course. Um, but one of the first ideas that he gives is that Sapiens survived because we can coordinate um, within our family, but also within groups that are larger than the family. A lot of species coordinate within the family. Um, and indeed, there are, um, and there are systems that we know of um, and that is why um, people have often been fascinated by bees, um, because they coordinate outside the immediate family. But of course, even then, there's this the queen bee that kind of is the mother of everyone. So sapiens can coordinate out the, outside the family. And the way one of the ways we do that is by um, setting up systems of communication, things that we all understand. Um, and, um, and, and that extends the... Um, the reach of who we can communicate with and work together with outside our immediate family. And whether that be um, by money or music or maps, we've got these systems, these coding systems, if you like, uh, which allow us to be predictable to each other, to render our lives coordinatable. And these systems usually involve uh, one thing standing in for another, um, signification, if you like. Uh, and they determine value and they give meanings and they, um, they create obligations that we have to each other. In other words, they bind us to each other. Now, um, there are two quite important philosophical traditions um, 
that relate to this idea of the words that we have that do things. And, and one of them is Stanley Cavell, who stands in um, quite stark contrast to European philosophy, which kind of threw itself into postmodern thinking, um, such as Jean Baudrillard, <laughs> Baudrillard the French philosopher's um, book, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place, which plays on the idea that um, there is often a massive gap between the tales we tell and the history that we live. But Stanley Cavell's tradition is, is quite different, and, and it does take that point, I think, of uh, Baudrillard. But um, if words can only inefficiently refer, um, if, if they don't bind us, if it doesn't really matter um, what we say, then um, we can't commit ourselves to each other. Then a lot of the aspects of our life that we've been studying in performances and ritual don't really work. Um, I can't just say anything and still hope that my life will go all right. It makes a massive difference to my life if I work on my language, both in terms of what I, um, what kind of things I say to each other, that I have a certain reticence and don't insult you, for example, or break our relationship, but also in terms of our habits of meaning, the words I choose to use habitually. Um, I can't just improvise linguistically and talk gibberish and still expect to be able to be understood, but also more importantly, perhaps to pay my bills, to be faithful to my spouse or my partner or to catch my bus. Whether we like it or not, we must mean what we say if we are to be together and live together with other humans. Now, that is true, but our words are also historical. So it's not true that words are necessarily um, objective because they bind us to each other. Um, our histories could have turned out differently. We can't just decide not to use them either because we are in history. We have got to start from where we are, not from where we wish we were. Now, the philosopher Immanuel Kant um, famously talked about the difference between an existing $200 and a non-existing $200. And the reality of not having that money is painfully uncompromising for some people. You can't just go out and say, right, I have, I hereby have $200. Um, and, and, and that reality, a lot of people have to live with. For other people, um, the reality of how much money I have in my account is not as much the, um, the uncompromising reality of, of my life situation, but it's dependent upon um, on what um, certain speculators had for breakfast or how anxious they're feeling or what Elon Musk has tweeted today. And that makes a massive difference to the value of the things that I own. Marketing ideas, economic ideas, such as the marketing idea, you can always rely on a VW. They are improvised. Uh, they are improvised in marketing offices all over the world um, and, and marketers um, try to come up with that kind of good sentence. But the reality that they produce um, um, produces um, and determines employment statistics and the real lived lives of people all over the world. So we are determined by these words, um, but we can also play with them um, problematically. Uh, Reynold Niebuhr wrote in 1943 the serenity prayer saying God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference and he meant it about life in general but we can apply it specifically to the freedom and unfreedom we live in uh, when we live with our language and in our language and it's extremely difficult to know what we can and can't change when it comes to our words um, and I know of no uh, philosophical or religious or political text that has really given us the final answer to what this wisdom actually looks like. So that is the ambiguity and the difficulty we are faced with when we are when we are deciding how we are going to talk in our classrooms and in our lives, um, how we are going to survive because this is essential to how we are going to live together. And, and that is the question that brings us together to this University College of Ustfell, which may or may not exist, and I'm not sure I've ever seen it, not a university college. I've seen lots of buildings and students and people. And it's tempting to say that because I've never seen it, because it is a kind of fiction, uh, we can change it. But in reality, I've worked as, as a trade union rep in this institution. It's quite difficult to make changes to this institution. 
um, these fictions that kind of impose ourselves on our everyday life, um, they do so very painfully and rigidly sometimes. Things like nationality, money, institutions and words. We, we bash our heads against them. They are really historically conditioned and least logical, but also least compromising.